This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with Robert McCauley, who is an emeritus professor at Emory University, uh, where he was uh, the director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. Um, and he's also the author or co-author of many books, including uh, Rethinking Religion, Bringing Ritual uh, to Mind, uh, this book right here called uh, Why Religion is Natural and Science is Not. And, of course, the most recent book, which is called Hearing Voices and Other Matters of the Mind, What Mental Abnormalities Can Teach Us About Religions. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Now, I want to focus mainly on this book, which is uh, Why Religion is Natural and Science is is not um and you're someone who is sitting kind of at the interface of cognitive science and 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 biology you talk uh, a bit about evolution in the book and um when you say that religion is natural and science is is not i think um there will be people who will agree and disagree <laughs> with different uh, parts of of the argument which is really quite um quite subtle um but among evolutionary biologists, I think plenty of them would be willing to go along with the claim that religion is is natural, but they'll go to great lengths to uh, come up with a, a functional story, right? They'll talk about how it is either functional at the individual level, giving individuals some survival advantage, or there'll be a, kind of a, a group selection story uh, around uh, religion, but I, I think your your argument uh, as to the naturalness of religion is is a little bit different. It's not a, f- a functional one. It's it's I guess we could call it a a a, a spandrel story or a byproduct story. Uh, is is that would that be a fair description? Yeah, uh, uh, fairly routinely, the position is known as the byproduct uh, theory or byproduct view. Um, I should point out right at the outset, perhaps, that uh, there's nothing about this story that's inconsistent with a functional account. That is to say, both can be true at the same time. Uh, And, you know, I think there's some evidence for uh, functional accounts, uh, both at the individual and the collective level. But um, what, what I'm interested in principally are the sort of cognitive foundations of religion. And, um, In particular, the the sorts of forms that religious representations take. Uh, And the the argument, in short, is just that um, we've got minds that are built in in particular ways, uh, in part by evolution and uh, part by sort of our cultural and social circumstances. Uh, And uh, those ways uh, inevitably have an influence on um, sort of the forms that uh, any number of cultural products take, but certainly religions. Um, and so, in short, certain kinds of representations are um, just going to be more appealing to uh, human minds than other kinds of representations. Uh, and the overall thesis of the book, of course, is, is that religious representations are ones that have evolved to um, by way of cultural evolution, to um, take forms that tend to be quite appealing to human minds for the most part. Um, uh, and that's in striking contrast to scientific representations, which typically don't. Um, uh, the argument, in short, uh, looks in part to some of the work that has arisen in evolutionary psychology, uh, which is to say that uh, uh, whether or not we have a kind of uh, uh, rigorously modular mind or not, I'm not sure is, is so crucial. Um, but the notion that we do have certain sorts of domain-specific capacities, um, that there are just a lot of problems that humans and our human and our ancestors had to solve in order to get by in the world. And then... But you also mentioned that there there is no department of religion in in the brain and and there are others that have mentioned things like you know the god gene which of course uh you know you you, you don't even uh, mention mention that theory right so you're arguing that it's there's no religion module but rather it is 
part of the the general cognitive an outgrowth of the general cognitive architecture of humans, right? Yeah, uh, precisely. The argument is that, and this is why it's a byproduct view, which is to say that the forms that religious representations take have to do with uh, cognitive dispositions uh, and of our mental lives that uh, don't have anything to do with religion. Uh, and they don't even necessarily have anything to do with one another. Uh, I mean, um, of course, illustrations probably would be helpful. Uh, uh, human beings are, are quite sensitive about hazards uh, in their environments. Uh, and there are a whole host of uh, folks who have done research on sort of our hazard precaution systems. Um, uh, one way of uh, sort of uh, snapping to attention on this for I think probably most American listeners would be at least I'm getting fairly old. I'm emeritus after all by now, but uh, at least when I was a kid, it was called cooties. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was a game that we all played. And, and it wasn't that anybody ever instructed you in that game. Uh, but the notion was it was a kind of mock play at hazard precaution. Right. Everybody knows the rules of cooties. Right. I mean, if uh, if I touch you, if I'm the person who has cooties and I touch you on your shoulder, you've got cooties now and you don't just have cooties right there where I touched you. You've got cooties all over. Right. And then you go off and you touch someone else and um, and cooties spread. Um, probably an apt uh, illustration in these pandemic days we're living through. Um so this is the, the contamination management system that you reference in, in the book, right? Sure, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I suppose a listener uh, who has, you know, not familiar with the work would instantly sort of respond, well, you know, what's this have to do with religion? Um, well, the suggestion is that uh, there's an awful lot about um, things like the designation of sacred spaces, that have everything to do with cueing uh, precisely that sort of hazard precaution system. Uh, the point about it is, is that it's immediate, uh, it's uh, instant. Well, it's instantaneous. It's intuitive. It's uh, robust, uh, and it's uh, basically unconscious. Uh, that is to say, if we know that there's a hazard in our environment, uh, we know to sort of, for example, if, if that substance sitting over there is poison, right, we sort of keep our distance from it um, and probably more and we don't touch it. And then we know a whole bunch of things like that. Well, I mean, religions enlist these kinds of intuitive uh, inferences when they mark off a sacred space. Uh, I mean, the point is people know instantly. They don't have to you know, sit down and read a book about this or anything like that. Uh, it, it's there. Um, and the argument, in short, is, is that there are a whole host of, of these kinds of capacities. Uh, and um, um, they're comparatively, don't, there's, I think, ample evidence that they're comparatively domain-specific capacities. Uh, and uh, it looks like religions, but not just religions, I mean, a number of, of, of cultural systems around the world, uh, uh, you know, can sort of cue these capacities. And once they're cued, they fire automatically. Um, the, I mean, the, the sort of parade case for this historically has been our acquisition of natural language. Uh, I mean, babies don't need to be taught natural language. Uh, they just hang around with people who are speaking and they start speaking. Uh, they uh, gain a command of of, uh, of the language of, of their culture. Um, you know, we're a talkative species. Well, again, you know, I mean, well, how does religion enlist this? Um, the point about this is, is that um, let's go back for just a second and review sort of the automaticity about language. Yeah, I was going to say we should probably define. Um both natural and religion, maybe start with natural. Um, and, you know, I think this book came out probably before uh, Kahneman's book. Um, otherwise you may have kind of referenced the system one, system two, you, you, it came you, out you simultaneously. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, you talk about kind of in, intuition and, and reflective, so reflective cognition and 
more intuitive cognition. But then with, within intuitive cognition, you, you talk about kind of more natural and more uh, kind of practiced um, intuition, right? So there's the riding a bicycle, which is becomes intuitive, but requires some some practice, uh, maybe some teaching, uh, and uh, the more intuitive uh, intuition, which includes things like you know how to walk, how to chew, how to how to speak, and and grammatically and so forth, right? Yeah, uh, I actually um, I, I I don't cite Kahneman's book because I hadn't seen it yet uh, when I wrote the book, but uh, they came out the same year. Um, but uh, in short, I'm suggesting that Kahneman's uh, distinction, perfectly appropriate, but that within uh, System 1, there's a further distinction to be made. And that's a distinction between uh, what I've called maturational naturalness and practice naturalness. Um, that is to say, how is it that uh, we have intuitions about things? Well, in short, I'm suggesting there are two possible sources. Um, I mean, there's a great deal of debate that has been raging for decades about sort of the origins of what I'm calling maturationally natural systems, um, arguments about innateness and, you know, genetic uh, right. uh, blueprints and that sort of thing. And, and things um, like things like embodied cognition, that, that would be part of this maturational um, intuition, right? Like, uh, well, uh, embodied cognition, I think, can be either. <laughs> I think it okay. can be that okay, some of it is probably maturational and some of it is practiced. Um, uh, but well, like our, fo it. our folk, our folk understanding of, of physics, right? Our ability to use the example of, you know, when you see something rolling off the table, you know, you, you, you reach for it and grab it without doing any kind of trigonometry right um exactly. and that's presumably yeah. something that you didn't need a teacher you didn't need a a course um you didn't need to kind of major in um physics to grab that ball before it falls off the table right yeah exactly though i mean you know how you get evidence about these matters among other things uh, one of the principal forms of evidence has been you know the flourishing developmental psychology in the last four or five decades uh, you study babies, uh, and it comes as some surprise that uh, babies prior to about six months of age don't have any presumptions about gravity. Uh, they're uh, unsurprised by the notion that something might just float in the air, for example. Um, it, it, that actually comes a little later than certain other physical mm -hmm. intuitions. Uh, the evidence suggests that at, as young as perhaps even three months of age, Babies are already clear that two objects can't occupy the same space at the same time. Uh, and if they are presented with a display that sort of, you know, magically, so to speak, uh, looks like that's what's happened, uh, that attracts their attention uh, in significantly longer uh, chunks of time than it would be, as opposed to them seeing, say, a ball floating in the air. Uh, no, the fundamental is even gravity is. It's not something that's there right at the outset. It doesn't seem. Um, maybe I, I mean, should stop maybe? you there because you know, as when you talk about how science is is sort of uh, unnatural, um, there are people that would argue that the way in which children come to understand things like gravity is through something similar to the scientific method, right? That they engage in, in experimentation and um, the, they, uh, their curiosity leads them to test the, the boundaries of the different, you know, laws of physics and, and so forth. Um, and so that lear learning process is the origins of, the, of what it means to be a, a scientist, right? And so that science would be the thing which would just be the natural continuation of this childlike practice of experimentation, and uh, uh, and something gets in the way and something, you know, we, we in the business schools, we, we, we try to convince people that, um, you know, kids are, are, are wiser than adults because they haven't unlearned this, this curiosity. Um, uh, so, you know, how would you address that? How would you, you, you distinguish the way in which this maturational intuition develops from, say, the scientific method? 
Um, <laughs> well, you've asked a lot of questions uh, in that one. That one's a complex one, but uh, I have a number of things to say. Uh, um, I, I'm not willing to deny by any means that, um, in effect, there's a sort of uh, um, experimentalism about uh, little kids' behaviors, and it may be that in part it's precisely having gained those extra three months of experience that's made an important contribution to the infant's ability to suddenly start being, you know, ha in short, having expectations about gravity, so that when they're uh, um, um, uh, violated, uh, you know, that grabs the in infant's attention, right? Um, there are uh, at least two other important things I want to say about this because you've asked a very broad question and I sort of probably can't address it at every level of detail. But um, the first is that uh, um, science, it seems to me, is uh, something that also has certain cognitively natural dimensions to it. I'm not implying um, that there is nothing cognitively natural about science. Um, the uh, uh, disposition to sort of formulate theories, it seems to me, is something that just comes very, very naturally to humans. And uh, as, um, you know, Karl Popper, for example, argued 60 70 years ago, um, it doesn't require uh, a whole bunch of sort of counterexamples. Um, it's sort of, you get a single counterexample and you leap to a theory. Uh, why, why is this uh, thing out of order in my living room? Uh, well, my wife must have had some uh, um, something in mind such that she did that and then I might begin to hypothesize about what that was. Um, so that's the first comment. It seems to me that uh, there are some things about science that are as cognitively natural um, as um, the kinds of uh, dispositions of mind that I'm looking to when I talk about religion. Uh, however, the second comment, and the, this is sort of the second big comment about science, is, is that it seems to me that isn't enough in the case of science. Um, that in fact, that kind of speculation is something that is sort of occurs all over the place in human life. Um, but uh, what really distinguishes science is its uh, critical activities. That is to say, once those hypotheses have been advanced, what scientists uh, have to do is to figure out ways to sort of, in short, test them, uh, uh, figure out whether or not they stack up well with the, uh, the with the facts. Uh, and so they go out and they search for facts and uh, sometimes they generate new facts by setting up experiments um, with very, very special environments a lot of the time because that's the only way you can kind of tease out the subtle implication of a theory. Um, then once they start collecting that kind of factual evidence, uh, they've got to be able to sort of know how to assess that evidence. Um, I mean, I think that we probably have, uh, there's, there's good evidence of a piece with the uh, infant, the hypothetical infant that you were describing in your question, that we're, we're sensitive to the importance of evidence, that the evidence matters. But uh, as anyone knows who has taken a course in inferential statistics, for example, um, sort of assessing evidence and, and figuring out how it should be interpreted and um, uh, making, you know, the ability to analyze its import is, is an extremely difficult task uh, that takes a, a huge amount, frankly, of education. Um, that so, 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 so the difference between sort of the scientific approach and the more folk scientific or intuitive approach to navigating the world is partially due to a different view of evidence and the role of evidence and a sensitivity to evidence, uh, a formal structure around the inquiry, um, a level of abstraction. I think you talk about kind of, kind of what makes kind of humans different from pre-humans is this, this ability to, go across domains or modules, right, to draw inferences or ideas from one area and, and transfer them to other areas? Is, 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 that, is that ability something which is 
at the heart of the scientific ex- enterprise, or is that something that, that is pre-scientific? Uh, well, I think that the answer to that can be that it's both. <laughs> uh, that is to say that it may well, I think that capacity existed before science existed, but I think that it is in some ways at the heart of scientific activity. Um, uh, certainly scientists uh, quite regularly use analogical reasoning. Uh, and I take it that's uh, sort of the quintess- quintessential illustration of the, of the sorts of capacities that you're talking about. Um, I mean, I, I frankly coined the notion of maturational naturalness in order to avoid strong claims about nativism or innateness or even modules. Um, but what you're alluding to is what uh, the archaeologist, cognitive archaeologist Steve Mythen has called cognitive fluidity. Uh, this notion that sort of what makes us different, at least in part, is um, that we don't have the kind of minds that uh, some evolutionary psychologists have said we have. Uh, that is to say that we have these sort of uh, encapsulated modules uh, that deal with the host of particular kinds of problems that I've been alluding to. Everything so from like the Cosmides, Cosmides and Tubi kind of approach. Yeah. Uh, that uh, the, the, the well-known metaphor is that the mind is like a Swiss Army knife, right? Mm-hmm. And it has all these specialized tools that can be sort of pulled out. Well, um, Mythen argues that's really this, the, the right story about our uh, distant prehistoric ancestors, perhaps, but it, it's not the right story about us that, that um, ensured, among other things, and principally the development of, a, of a, uh, an elaborate and complex natural language enables us to, um, as he puts it, um, develop cognitive fluidity between these capacities so that information from one can be used in, in other domains. Um, I mean, we quite routinely, uh, well, sorry, uh, you're in Berkeley and I'm in Atlanta, so neither of us do this so much anymore, but uh, I spent my first 33 years in the North uh, and before I came to Atlanta. And um, there in the wintertime, especially in those days, you, you quite routinely talk to your car, uh, begging it to start <laughs> and, and hoping it will uh, be able to sort of withstand the, the rigors of the winter, uh, just like most of us talk to our computers. Uh, what are we doing? Well, I mean, we're transferring uh, our um, insured theory of mind, really, uh, the notion that uh, we can detect other things out there in our environment that have minds and that we understand how minds work. Um, and we sort of, that, that's a sort of coping uh, ability that we have for getting along in the world that that comes extremely naturally to us. Um, And uh, so it's really good if we can sort of act like we can use that in other domains. And so we do. (laughs) Um, Sometimes it feels like we've done it effectively. And then other times when the car just won't start, we're pretty clear that all the coaxing didn't help. Right. So, so I guess, there, these are things which you sometimes you refer to as transfers or, or, or breaches, but they, they the only way you identify their mistake is through the scientific lens, right? I mean, I think the the view of of some people in judgment decision making w- would be, oh, look, gotcha, look at all these kind of irrationalities, um, and I think there's an entirely different approach, which is to say that, hey, all these things which appear to be illusions or errors or, or mistakes, you know, they're, they're fairly effective in the context in which they are used most of the time, right? So you, you, you talk in the book about how when you're walking on a ship, right, in one direction versus the other direction, you perceive the, the, the speed of the ship to be changing. You know, there's the uh, optical illusions that we, we've all seen right um and it's and you know even when you're aware of them you still continue to experience them uh it's just that the system too will kick in and tell you hey just don't don't act on it right you know you know it's there um but you can't make yourself stop seeing it but you know enough to know that you shouldn't act on it but those those so-called illusions or mistakes or errors are kind of an 
almost inevitable byproducts of the the way in which they're they're designed. Uh, this this type of intuition is that, is that a fair statement? Uh, yeah, I mean, part of the reason that I started with some optical illusions uh, has to do with precisely the notion that uh, maturationally natural capacities influence. Uh, sort of everything from the perceptual front end uh, through the cognitive workings and all the way through to the, the motoric uh, behavioral uh, outcome, so to speak. Right. Um, so nat so natural doesn't mean accurate, right? And there's no, no and there's not, there's no evolutionary pressure to force uh, the, this natural intuition to become more accurate, Right. That's correct. Uh, yeah, uh, evolution doesn't necessarily get us to the truth. It gets us to a condition where we're able to propagate our genes. Mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes that coincides reasonably well with a fairly accurate account of affairs, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so that ship, for example, I, I, anybody who's a mariner who has been on large ships out in the open ocean, uh, uh, I've learned all of them know about this illusion, uh, but I was a complete novice. It was the very first time I had ever been on a ship uh, out in the ocean, and uh, for me, it was it was astonishing uh, because I no one had warned me uh, that uh, depending on sort of how you're moving on the ship will uh, um, influence your sense of how fast the ship is moving. And what is particularly striking is when you uh, sort of move from one position uh, that creates one kind of um, illusion to the other, and then the shift is just uh, sort of astonishing. Um, but that's all about sort of how our perceptual systems are built. Um, we're, we, you know, we have a visual system that evolved in a world without any machines of the modern ilk. Uh, and uh, so it turns out that our, our machinery, we, we've developed all kinds of ways of tricking our eyes. Uh, think about, I mean, I'm not, there are plenty of sophisticated things with computers, but I mean, simple things. Think about the old days when, you know, you would go to the movie theater and there would be a, a string of light bulbs around the periphery of the sign and those light bulbs would be timed. But what, what you saw was motion. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just the timing of the bulbs when they were going on and off. Uh, I mean, again, we're not, uh, we don't have a visual system built to sort of manage that sort of stuff very well. Um, and so we are subject to errors. And so the, the key, I mean, the key, one of the key illusions, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the point about, the, about those illusions, though, uh, is one that uh, uh, the famous philosopher of psychology, Jerry Fodor, uh, made a long time ago. And that is that they are persisting illusions. Mm -hmm. And that's an argument, again, for this sort of encap strong encapsulation view, um, which is to say, even though you come to understand what's going on in the illusion, it doesn't affect the fact that you still see the illusion. You can't correct what you see on the basis of what you know. And so his argument is that's an evidence that visual input is encapsulated, um, that it isn't penetrated by sort of our central knowledge. And so I think the key illusion that is at the heart of the book is this uh, idea of attribution of agency, right? The intentional stance where you, um, you, you see objects as having some intention, right? I mean, I guess it was referred to as animism at some point, right? I mean, I remember reading the, the pre-Socratics and kind of the emergence of philosophy was all about kind of, um, shrinking the scope of, of agency in the, in the world. That was sort of the, the, the thing which ignited, you know, philosophy and, and, and science. And, and indeed, I think that this is at the heart of the distinction that we're going to uh, get to um, between religion and, and science is this scope of agency attribution. Um, but you offer up a, 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 a theory, which is that, um, okay, there are things out there with agency, things without, and you attribute it and you don't. And you can make two types of errors, right? One is that you attribute agency to something which doesn't have it. And then the other is you, you don't attribute agency to things uh, that, that have it. Um, and the cost of one type of mistake is higher than the other. And so we're evolved to make more false positives than false negatives. Is that, is that a fair 
fair statement, and that's kind of something which we're even if we we work on overcoming it, it's it's a very difficult thing to overcome. Uh, so if we're looking at dots on the screen, we we sort of get inside the head of the dot and figure out well what that what is that dot going to do right? What does it want to do? What's it trying to achieve when it's kind of moving around on the screen? Um, yeah, uh, again, you've, you've touched on a whole bunch of topics. Uh, first of all, uh, this sort of notion of agency detection, I take it as a sort of very, very elementary component of, of a larger construct that is encompassed by theory of mind, uh, that is to say, in short, what things out there are the agents and have at least proto minds or maybe even developed minds. Um, the uh, one of the claims is uh, that um, in the history of modern science, what we've seen is a progressive restriction on the domains in which we are willing to sort of regard attributions of agency as legitimate explanations. Uh, I mean, in the ancient world, um, you know, uh, the oceans, uh, the the atmosphere, the weather, uh, these things were gods, they were agents. Um, and slowly but surely, uh, uh, modern science has, has brought ever increasing and more progressive restriction on the domains where we say we're allowed to sort of refer to agents and think we've got a, a good explanation. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the dots uh, illustration is, as, as I know you know, uh, one that is indeed built into the developmental literature. Um, if you show baby screens where you've got two screens, for example, they can look at either one, right? Uh, each of them has dots in them. Uh, the dots are the same size, the dots are the same colors, the dots move at exactly the same speeds in the screens. Um, the dots change direction at exactly the same moments that they do in each screen. But in one screen, where you, and in each case, you've got multiple dots in each screen, right? Uh, where in effect, one of those dots looks like it's chasing one of the some of the other dots or stalking them, or uh, um, and sure enough, reliably uh, in preverbal infants, um, this is a uh, this is one of those findings that is well replicated. By the way, uh, those preverbal infants' attention will disproportionately attend to that screen where it looks like, in short, we've got a dot that's an agent. Um, and note, it's just a dot. <laughs> mm. I mean, a great deal of uh, research, again, about what I'm calling maturationally natural systems has to do with things like face recognition. Uh, and again, face recognition is another kind of, um, at our, at our, uh, another maturationally natural capacity that religions sometimes seize upon in, in all kinds of icon, icon, iconography. Um, but the dots don't even have faces. Mm -hmm. And the kid, and the babies are already attentive to it. Uh, they're disposed to sort of, you know, pay attention to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think amongst all of the maturationally natural systems, the one that is sort of uh, key to most of those, uh, I mean, I'm probably being uh, needlessly cautious here. Uh, I, I guess I'm willing to say that pretty much all of those systems out there that we count as religions, um, this um, agency detection and theory of mind is probably um, the one that is most prominent and most prominent in the way that religions deploy it uh, and cue it. Um, and um, and of course the point about this is is that because these systems are natural, cognitively natural, uh, because they're intuitive, because they're automatic, because they're instantaneous, it just means that folks instantly know how to manage them. They don't need to be taught that God thinks about certain things certain ways, or that if he, if he thinks about certain things certain ways, then he must want certain outcomes to, you know, go in one direction as opposed to another. Those are inferences that are just automatic. We get them for free. I, again, I mean, that's part of the point about maturationally natural systems, and that is, um, they come with a host of free inferences, and these inferences are unconscious. 
Uh, in the same way that you know, again, for example, if there's a contaminant over there, right? I mean, you don't go near that. You get away from it. Uh, you don't let it touch you. Um, those, again, are all sort of automatic inferences. Uh, an awful lot of this um, sometimes can sort of um, strike folks who, who hit this literature initially as sort of obvious. And in some ways, that's exactly right. This is explaining the obvious, but it's explaining why it's obvious. Because critters that don't come built with these capacities, it isn't obvious. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so easy to see this in other uh, animals, quite frankly. Uh, so, you know, sort of famously, if you uh, uh, sort of pitch a BB across the visual field of a frog, right? I mean, the frog will go for the BB. Um, why? Well, because it's close enough to what its per visual perception is concerned with, namely catching flies, which are food. Um, and, you know, we sort of are amused by that. Um, you pull a string across this, uh, your carpet at home and your cat is transfixed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all, you know, it's all it takes. Um, even though Cats didn't evolve around strings being pulled apart, uh, around carpets until just the last few hundred years, probably a thousand years or so at the most. Um, right. So, 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 so you're question. saying, right. So, so I think when you're looking at the functionality of these things, you, you talk about kind of in, in domain and, and, and out of domain, right? And so uh, the example, one of the examples you use is, you know, when an animal is, is, uh, uh, chasing another animal and then they mistake a UPS truck for another animal. Right. Or, um, you, you talked about the, the, the rain dance of the, the chimpanzees where, you know, you do a threat display against the enemy. So you do a threat display against a, a rainstorm. Right. So it's, it's, it's something that makes sense within a particular domain. And then it, but it kind of looks ridiculous when you, when you move it outside of that domain, but it makes well, perfect no, sense. We're not talking to our computers. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, uh, in each of these cases, uh, Dan Sperber makes a wonderful distinction between what he calls the proper domain and the real domain. Mm -hmm. And uh, not to belabor this distinction at great length, but the proper domain is in short, the domain of, uh, of stimuli and cues that led to the evolution of a capacity in the first place. Um, that is to say, all those agents that were out there that were our predators, uh, our, sorry, our ancestors' predators, and our ancestors got really, really very uh, concerned about them and, and could detect them uh, right away, right? I mean, this detection of agency. But in contrast to our the real domain, and the real domain is uh, filled with all kinds of cultural inventions, that we've come up with to trick these systems. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, to pick a mundane example, but one that I think cuts right to the chase is, admittedly, we haven't done this much in the last year and a half, but most of us have um, spent a fair amount of our time um, driving to the multiplex, plunking down our uh, $10 and going in and watching those movies. But you have to understand that movies are a perfect illustration of using technology to trick our maturationally natural dispositions, perceptual dispositions. We see a whole world on those screens, but it isn't there. It's just light on a white surface and it's light changing. But for example, when that light changes, we see things like motion. Or we see things like people. And I mean, then we theory of mind kicks in. We do all kinds of inferences are rolling there. But the way to dispel this very easily is to just get up out of your seat, walk down to the side of the, of the screen and look across it sideways. And you'll suddenly realize this is just a great perceptual illusion. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe... We, maybe we, we've gotten this far without defining religion, um, right? I mean, as distinct from, uh, say, stories or narratives or optical illusions, you know. And, and I think, you know, you, you use a, a definition which is different from some other definitions. You, you mentioned Stephen Jay Gould's attempt to uh, carve a line between what we might think of as understanding 
the world, right, and causation, which is the domain of science, and then, you know, anything related to, to meaning or normativity, that's sort of the, the domain of the, the religious magisterium. And, and that really doesn't line up with our common sense understanding of what religion is, right? And I think, you know, his formulation works as a way of deflecting the dismissiveness of, say, Daniel Dennett and others. I mean, I wouldn't say he's dismissive, but, you know, the argument that that religion is 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 fiction and is is something that we uh, contain stories about people with beards up in mountain tops and so forth. You're, you're really arguing that that religion has much more substantive content and includes theories about the world uh, and is not simply restricted to this domain of normativity and and uh, and meaning, right? Or that you can't talk um, about meaning without also talking about some causal uh, understanding of the world. Uh, certainly, I hold that view. That's right. Uh, let me back up and just make one quick qualification, and that is uh, I actually don't offer any definitions of religion. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really not interested in definitions of religion. I'm not worried about that. You know, um, what I'm interested in is sort of cognition and how it impacts uh, a whole host of systems out there in the world that we call religions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if they have something in common or not. I think cognitively they probably do. But, but to go on to the, the Gould uh, point, yeah, I, I'm... Um, uh, I criticize Gould's position. Uh, you're quite right in the final chapter of the book. Um, he, uh, his way of sort of making peace between science and religion is to sort of uh, attribute uh, explanatory endeavors and descriptive endeavors about the way the world is and the facts about the world uh, to science. Um, and then to sort of argue that re religion is concerned with uh, uh, values and morals and and meaning, uh, and um, there are a variety of of uh, criticisms I have, including the fact that it seems to me, you, you, as you've just correctly pointed out, it can't do meaning without having explanations. Um, the, the the meaning involves a whole list of presumptions about the proper explanations about the world. Um, but also, I think that there's a sort of uh, dismissiveness that's implicit in Gould's position, and it's implicit in um, a lot of, frankly, academics' takes on religion. Uh, Gould, at one point, uh, I mean, quite straightforwardly, uh, a host of folks are creationists out there uh, in uh, American Christianity, for example. Uh, you know, the notion that, I mean, that, that's an explanatory theory. Uh, that's a view about how a whole bunch of facts about the world came to be as they are. Um, Gould's response to this is to simply say that they don't represent the magisterium um, of religion. And my view is, is that this is just, um, this is just an untenable position. I mean, what you're saying is, is that you're dismiss dismissing the religiosity of literally tens, if not hundreds of millions of people around the world. Um, so I, I, I don't I don't subscribe to that that particular way of trying to sort of uh, make peace between science and religion. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you also make a distinction between what you call religion and, and theology uh, and. I found this interesting because you argue that, that theology is just as counterintuitive as as science is, right? In in a way, um, because it, it it's you know it's very abstract. It, it it kind of starts getting further and further away from some of these 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 folk intuitions, um, and that it's within the domain of the highly literate, and it's supported by texts and institutions and. And, uh, and it's it's not something that we see, you know, in 
more primitive societies. It's, it's, uh, it's, could, could you elaborate on that distinction? I mean, you have this wonderful two by two. I, I, I wanted to talk about that from the very beginning because as, as someone who teaches management, we do everything in two by twos. And the, I, I found that to be like a really, really cool two by two where on the X axis you have, uh, I guess it's kind of scope of, agency attribution and then on the on or the realm of agency attribution i forget what it was and then on the y-axis you have kind of this intuitive and and kind of counterintuitive axis could you could you just talk about that i wish i could throw it up uh, as a as a slide here um sure uh the one of the sort of uh crisp ways of capturing this is to say that um i think that uh, from a cognitive perspective, um, the uh, sort of standard religion science comparisons that everybody has been engaged in at least since Darwin. I mean, there are literally uh, uh, whole floors of libraries virtually now that could be filled with books that address these things. Um, but, but, but from a cognitive perspective, that's a sort of misbegotten comparison. Why? Uh, because um, science and religion are much more like theology and common sense explanations than they are like each other. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's start with the case that you've offered here, and that is the science and theology comparison. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that theology is as radically counterintuitive as science, but it's certainly radically counterintuitive. I mean, take the, any number of conventional uh, doctrines of uh, sort of mainline traditional historic Christianity. Um, three people are one person. Uh, well, no, that's counterintuitive, right? Uh, uh, Jesus is both- It's like quantum physics. Yes, exactly. It, uh, Jesus is both God and he's both, you know, completely God and completely human. Uh, and, uh, well, that, that one's also sort of a funny counterintuitive kind of claim. Um, and, uh, and pretty radically so, so that it's extremely difficult to understand. Uh, and people can write tome after tome after tome about this in the same way that scientists produce huge amounts of work arguing about uh, the details of particular scientific theories. Um, likewise, theologians um, employ many of the same sort of cognitive uh, uh, and intellectual capacities, uh, deductive inference, inductive inference, uh, you know, probabilistic assessments of probability, uh, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, um, In that regard, then, I do want to try to make a distinction between theology uh, as a thoroughly kind of reflective and, and oftentimes quite counterintuitive sort of enterprise, uh, thinking about religion, in short, and about religious claims, as opposed to what I call popular religion. Uh, religion that is, uh, you know, the religion, you know, not to put too fine an edge on it, the religion of the masses of people, um, historically, the overwhelming majority of whom were not literate uh, in human history, um, and in plenty of places in the world are still not literate. Uh, so one of the things that you see right away is, is that if literacy, for example, is necessary, as I argue, it is necessary for theology, for theological activity of any extended sort, and likewise for some it's not at all necessary for, for what I'm calling popular religion. I mean, mm -hmm. religion predates literacy. I mean, it's very invention. So surely literacy is not a, a condition that is required for religion. And one of the things that also follows from this is, is that religion doesn't need theology. Lots of things out there that we, uh, when we say people are doing things that we count as religious, they're living in cultures where there isn't um, you know, a theologian to be found, uh, or a theological institution to be found. Um, my my former colleague here at Emory, uh, now long since retired, but uh, Frederick Barth uh, spent uh, a year living amongst the Bakhtamon in Highland, New Guinea, uh, a group of 183 people. Uh, and he wrote a book about their sort of what we would 
basically call their religious beliefs, their rituals, and uh, their ritual uh, religious beliefs. And one of the comments that he makes in that book is, is that he, he never heard a single theological claim the entire year he was there. Um, so theology is not necessary for religion. Um, religion involves these intuitive, maturationally natural forms of uh, what I'm calling popular religion overwhelmingly turns on sort of cueing those systems and all of those automatic inferences about how agents work, about how spaces are designated, uh, about uh, things like recognizing faces, uh, icons, uh, of, uh, likewise with language. I, I started into this a little earlier, um, but you know, as I said, language is sort of the parade case for what I'm calling a maturationally natural system. Um, but how do religions, it's, I mean, obviously, religious people talk. I mean, everybody knows that, right? I mean, we all talk. We're all talkers. Uh, we're a talkative species. But, but how do religions engage that capacity as a maturationally natural system? And the answer is um, glossolalia. Uh, glossolalia is so-called speaking in tongues. Uh, first thing is that Christians should understand this isn't something they invented. Uh, it's in loads of religious traditions uh, across human history and across cultures and across religions. Um, but what's going on there? <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, humans start producing utterances. Uh, we, we, Again, these systems are mandatory. They are automatic. You can't shut them off. I mean, one way that Jerry Fodor nicely illustrated this was, um, if you're listening right now, right? I mean, you can't avoid hearing the sounds I'm making as language. Mm -hmm. um, you can't hear them in the same way that you hear uh, those sounds. Um, your interpreter kicks in automatically. So what happens when you start hearing people making utterances? The first inference is, this must be language, mm -hmm. right? And if it's language, the next inference is, it must mean something. So I better, you know, sort of be attentive. Uh, glossolalia, uh, heteroglossia, I mean, but glossolalia in particular, uh, is the, you know, a, a classic way in which religions, again, cue a maturationally natural system and get it rolling. Um, do we have these capacities in other domains? Sure we do. Uh, and that's what I'm calling broadly common sense explanations about the world. So theology differs from popular religion in the same way that science, professional science, uh, differs from sort of common sense explanations about the world. As you were pointing out much earlier, I mean, you know, sort of as you put it, folk science. Uh, what the deliverances of our maturationally natural systems are about all sorts of issues that science tackles. How objects, uh, you know, projectile motion, for example, to pick a really juicy and wonderful illustration. Uh, uh, science, this is the McClus McCluskey test? Yes. Uh, Michael McCluskey, uh, I'm proud to say a, a, a product a long, long, long time ago from Emory University, uh, who is at Johns Hopkins, did just some spectacular research on this uh, a few decades now ago, but uh, showing that uh, if you give people very, very simple problems um, in uh, physics, uh, you know, common mechanical problems, um, there are intuitions about these things. They've got these intuitions, and they're pretty powerful intuitions, and they're dead wrong. <laughs> but as you correctly pointed out, they're good enough for people to get by under most circumstances, even to the point of being able to catch a fly ball in baseball. Um, uh, it turns out when you you know you ask people uh, how that baseball is actually traveling, they they'll give you a, a what is a pretty seriously and importantly uh, incorrect description. Most folks will, uh, uh, but um, in fact outfielders know how to do it <laughs> and you, you pair that it, you pair that insight with the the barrett and keel results could, could you talk a bit about about that uh sure uh, uh barrett and kyle yeah frank kyle, kyle. uh 
they um, uh, had these uh, wonderful experiments. This was done by Justin Barrett back uh, in the mid 1990s, um, in which uh, they show that uh, even if it's the case that you give people accounts of, uh, in short, let's say religious topics, um, uh, that uh, even if the accounts are completely, uh, as it were, orthodox, so to speak, that is to say there's nothing in them that is contrary to orthodox understandings of uh, sort of who God is or how God works or that sort of thing, uh, that when folks process these kinds of inputs and then recall them, they don't recall them the way they actually you know, the actual inputs, what they do is they um, carry out what they cleverly call theologically incorrect uh, mm -hmm. accounts. So uh, in short, in a lot, an awful lot of these vignettes, what happens is God, um, God's really still really cool. Uh, and he's still got a tremendous amount of power and everything, but he's really a lot more like a kind of Superman than he is God. So he does hear certain things that are closer to him better than he hears things that are far away. Uh -huh. um, he uh, does do things sequentially so that even though he's, I mean, he's really fast, <laughs> um, but he can you know, zip from one place to another all over the world to get these things done. But that, it turns out, is the kind of memory representations that uh, even thoroughly you know, serious, uh, dedicated believers have. Um, so they, in short, argue that um, there is a kind of theological incorrectness that inevitably infiltrates religious understandings. Why? Because of these maturationally natural systems. The theologies construct very, very elaborate, uh, complex, intellectually sophisticated accounts but when folks are sort of on the ground doing straightforward mm -hmm. inference about a world in which they live and in which agents operate, that stuff sort of just drifts off and all of these maturationally natural dispositions kick in instead. So people will draw, in short, un unorthodox inferences. Um, so, so, this is a cor so this is a corollary. So like the Shane Frederick concept that in... in um you know, decision-making that you don't actually replace the, the intuition. You, you kind of overlay something on top, but you never actually displace the intuition. So when a religious person familiarizes themselves with theology and, and doctrine, it doesn't replace kind of the, the folk understanding of, of religion. It just sort of, it's a layer on top, which can either, you know, intervene or, or not, depending on the level of reflection that somebody's engaging in. So maybe there, there's, there's room here for a cognitive reflection test around religion that you could develop. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean you've, hit the, you've hit the bullseye with the, the, your comment, um, because, of course, as you well know, one of the points I'm making in the book is this is also true about science. Mm -hmm. That is to say... One of the, the important morals of that McCloskey research that I was uh, alluding to a little earlier is um, he gives these kinds of simple problems, again, of projectile motion and things like that, um, to uh, students who have successfully completed even college-level courses in physics. And what he shows is, is that about uh, in that population, somewhere between about a quarter and a third of the, of the students, you know, after the semester's over, and um, in short, they revert right back to their sort of folk physics. That's no different from the religious folks reverting right back to their sort of folk popular religion, in contrast to the theological formulation. These students have learned um, uh, their Newtonian mechanics. Uh, and uh, but when faced with a problem subsequently, um, a whole bunch of them, in short, what I would argue is the maturationally natural intuitions persistently intrude. Mm -hmm. They never go away. You're exactly right. This notion of sort of what, what an education is about, frankly, 
an education of, of any sort in a, in a literate world is, is building on top of, it's an overlay over those, those dispositions, those cognitive dispositions that we're never going to get rid of. This is the point again about the persistence of the illusions. You're not going to get rid of them. You can know more stuff, but you're, they're going to constantly keep popping up, so to speak. Now, there's there's a piece part of the book where you talk about kind of what leads to successful kind of religious narratives and and ideas and and there's an element there's there's some optimal amount of counterintuitiveness that is sort of baked in um, and is this this is sort of a, a a meme story right it's about the ideas and stories have to be they have to be memorable right they have to be easily communicable and uh, and, and they have to have, you know, be functional to some degree. And so the, there are these, these, these trade-offs if you want the story to survive. And, and part of it includes a, a bit of counterintuitiveness, like a talking snake or a um, burning bush or, or, or something like that. Could, could you elaborate on, on that piece of the story? Sure. I, I mean, interestingly, uh, throughout our conversation so far, we've actually mostly focused on what I've called the radically counterintuitive representations of mm-hmm. science or theology. Um, I take no credit for uh, the fundamental insight here. I mean, this is unequivocally um, the contribution of Pascal Boyer uh, in his wonderful book. Uh, well, it's actually he has the view and he lays it out in some journal articles and things like that 10 years before, but in his book, Religion Explained, which now appeared about 15 years ago. um, The argument in short is, is that, um, and remember, we're talking about uh, in the evolution of most religions in the course of human history, we're talking about uh, systems that have developed in non-literate cultures. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a book that you can go to and sort of retain the stories or retain uh, the the ritual instructions. Um, In short, you've got to remember all this. Mm -hmm. Um, So then one of the points about this is there's going to be incredible selection pressure in favor of, of things that are highly memorable. Um, as opposed to things like scientific uh, treatises, which are incredibly difficult to remember. This is why taking science classes is so difficult, right? Um, Boyer argues, uh, and this was his you know, great insight, uh, it seems to me, one of his many great insights, is that um, unlike those radically counterintuitive representations, religions quite standardly traffic in fairly, what I would call modestly counterintuitive representations, which is to say, they don't actually change things very much. They just change things a tiny little bit. Uh, So, um, you know, in any given story that appears in the Christian Bible, for example, right? I mean, Jesus isn't sort of all of these things at once, right? I mean, in one, he's walking on water, and another, he turns water into wine, and another, he raises uh, a fellow from the dead. Uh, um, in another, he's keenly aware that a particular person has touched him. He can read other people's minds in some stories, but the notion is, in any given story, right, the, the representation is one of the uh, the God, in short, having a very modest amount of counterintuitive abilities. I mean, you know, when Jesus is walking on the water, does he still know who his mom is? Sure he does. Does he still see across the water to the boat? Sure he does. Uh, does he still know how to speak his native language? Of course he does. I mean, the point about this is, is that with a minimal sort of tweak, so to speak, in our intuitions, most of the overwhelming majority of the inferences still come right through. Right. So he's not, he's not floating above the water. He's, he's walking on the water. And, you know, Lazarus wasn't dead for very long. He was, he was just kind of dead for a couple hours. Right. So, uh, so, so the, the, if, if it was, you raise somebody from the dead who died, you know, a hundred years ago, that would be a lot more, more counterintuitive, right? 
Well, I take it that would be more counterintuitive, but still, if it, if that was sort of all that was happening in the story, it would still be fairly minimal. Um, <laughs> I mean, in short, when we talked, you mentioned uh, a little earlier this notion of sort of uh, types of violations, um, that is to say, breaches and transfers. Uh, what happens in representations is either in minimally counterintuitive representations, any kind of counterintuitive representation, is, is that you either violate, there's a breach of some principle that, that we subscribe to. So, uh, uh, you know, the snake can talk. Uh, well, snakes don't talk. Uh, that's a violation of anything we understand about sort of linguistic abilities, uh, mental capacities, and so on, if, if snakes can do it, right? Um, the, um, um, actually, that's not a good illustration for a breach. Uh, let's, let's use Jesus walking on the water. It's a better one. Um, I mean, you know, people don't walk on water. If they're on the water, they should sink. Um, they should fall into the water. Uh, the snake is actually, I mean, it is a breach of a sort, but it's its a transfer. That It's an example of a transfer. Um, what we've done is we've transferred a psychological and cognitive capacity to a snake that are simply part of a species that don't have that psychological or, uh, capacity. Uh, but in each of these stories, the argument is, is that almost all of them involve but a single violation of this sort. Now, what's the point about that? One, highly memorable. I mean, even prior to that, highly attention-grabbing, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I mean, actually, as a kind of footnote to this, in a, a direction about where the next book is that I'm contemplating uh, getting started on here. I, actually, I'm started on it, uh, but writing is uh, the fact, um, uh, well, let's put it this way. There's a, uh, a consequence of this position that um, uh, figures in this next book, and that is uh, Hollywood has figured this out. Uh, there are a number of domains in the world that have figured out similar sorts of issues, right, about, uh, that religions have as well. Um, but, but Hollywood has, and they have most especially in the last couple decades, which is to say, um, if you read any film criticism now amongst film scholars, for example, uh, overwhelmingly what they're focused on is the fact that the whole industry has been taken over by super, superhero movies. Mm -hmm. And superheroes, comic superheroes, uh, you know, the comics of... Uh, that we read DC comics and Marvel comics and all those sorts of things as, as kids. Um, these heroes have basically, typically most of the same properties that the gods have in religions. Uh, that is to say, they don't have 46 violations. They've got one or two. Uh, It'd be hard to write a movie about uh, someone who is, you know, omniscient and, and omnipotent, right? It would be, it, it would it wouldn't be a it would be a very wouldn't be a very compelling narrative right <laughs> um uh it would be it's difficult to imagine exactly i'd agree with that yes um, mm -hmm. so the argument is uh these minimally or modestly counterintuitive representations are attention grabbing they are highly memorable they're readily communicable uh it's easy enough to cue straight away that um, that you do intend to commute uh, that, that, that they are cultural representations. Um, and so the argument is surprise, surprise, evolutions, sorry, religions all over the world have generally evolved in the direction of having precisely these kinds of characters at, at sort of very central to their operations. And so it's like, sci like science fiction, right? So with science fiction, there's, you know, there's a slight difference in sort of the the rules of the game, right? Maybe slight differences or in, you know, video games. If you're watching Super Mario, right, you know, the the things that he can do are a little bit different from what you could do on, on Earth, but they have their own logic and, and you can immediately understand that logic because it's close enough to, to what we what we understand about the world. 
It's a very nice summary. I mean, you put it very well. We immediately can understand the logic because it's close enough. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, but it's not just, you know, science fiction. It's not just religion. It's, um, as I said, you know, comic books, uh, uh, cartoons. Uh, uh, as kids, we, uh, I'm probably, I'm dating myself here, but I, I mean, I remember a cartoon called Mighty Mouse. Uh, and Mighty Mouse uh, had all sorts of, you know, capacities, sort of like Superman. But again, note in any particular episode, it was typically only one of those capacities that really mattered. He was really mm -hmm. strong at one point, or he could fly at another point, or uh, Superman yeah. has X-ray vision, if I remember correctly. Uh, um, but, you know, our, uh, and, and frankly, in folklore, I mean, this is not something that, that turns on just sort of modern society. I mean, uh, folklore is out there. It's existed for as long as our species has uh, been constructing narratives. Mm -hmm. They're not only just religious narratives. Now, one of the interesting insights at the end of the book is this idea that um, certain types of mental illness actually impair one's capacity for, for uh, religion. Um, in particular, uh, kind of autism and uh, various aphasias and you know if if brain damaged people are less capable of of religion then you know this this i think strengthens the case for religion being a, a natural byproduct of our cognitive abilities um could, could you talk a bit about that and also the 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 new book um because the, the new book is really all about how psychological illness and brain damage can tell us a whole lot about religion. Could, could you talk about that? I'd be happy to, but I want to, I want to make two important, uh, if I might, um, qualification, well, corrections in short. I wouldn't call it illness and I wouldn't call it damage. Um, uh, the term that we have typically used, and I say we, uh, this isn't the royal we, George, I wrote this book with a colleague, George Graham. Uh, yeah, I've got a, a new book out. Um, called Hearing Voices and Other Matters of the Mind, um, What Mental Abnormalities Can Teach Us About Religions. Um, uh, I don't think that, uh, and so the, the, what I was going to say is the term that we almost always opt for is disorders, uh, mm -hmm. uh, abnormalities, uh, things that aren't uh, the way the majority of a population seems to be, but uh, to call them either illnesses or damage, I'm I would not do that, certainly with regard to autism, for example. Um, I mean, autistic people, it's a you know, point well worth making. I mean, as to say, uh, 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 f folks who have autism, and you know, medium and high functioning folks who have autism, uh, it turns out for a variety of cognitive skills, they're a lot better than the so-called normal population. Yeah, sure. Um, so there are certain sorts of things that they can do extremely well. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, illness is a, is a normative term for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the argument in short, uh, to cut to the chase that I know that you want uh, to talk about, um, it concerns uh, autistic spectrum disorder in particular. Um, and the argument there is is grounded in part on uh, this whole conception of maturationally natural uh, capacities, and particularly theory of mind. Um, Simon Baron Cohen, uh, a researcher at the University of Cambridge in the UK, uh, and, you know, one of the world's prominent um, uh, researchers on ASD, uh, autistic spectrum disorders. Um, and uh, he advanced a view um, and continues uh, to that is one that is not unrelated to, you know, sort of what I'm out to capture with this notion of maturationally natural capacities. That is to say that um, that theory of mind, I mean, I think he's got a rather more strong modular view uh, of theory of mind. Um, and the notion is, is that um, uh, one of the prominent uh, uh, features of folks who have been diagnosed with ASD uh, is that there are just almost always impairments of theory of mind inferences. 
That is to say, the kind of imprint is that uh, it turns out by the time that the non, uh, as they would say, the neurotypical uh, population, by the time kids are six years of age, they can sort of carry out all kinds of elaborate inferences about uh, what kinds of mental representations you have and whether or not they're true or false and that sort of thing. Um, it is the case that uh, folks uh, with ASD uh, typically don't pass those kinds of tests mm -hmm. about these kinds of abilities to um, draw these inferences until they're teenagers. And uh, some of them don't ever pass them. Uh, I mean, folks who are high functioning will pass them. And I, I mean, I frankly, I think there's an explanation for how that works. Um, but the argument's a very simple one, and that is, um, in short, well, sorry, let me back up. Um, children who have ASD are uh, sort of famous for treating uh, people in their environment the same way they treat objects in their environment. So in other words, they make fewer false positives, but then they will make some false negatives when it comes to attributing agency. Well, uh, it's... I, let's put it this way, on, on Baron Cohen's view, um, that's still not quite the right way to put it, because what he says is, uh, the term that he coined is mind blindness. Mm -hmm. So there isn't any attributions of false positives or false negatives, because there isn't any attributions of minds, period. People and animals are things in the world that move around, just like there are other things in the world that don't move around. And in short, right, I mean, uh, the argument is, is that these kids need to be educated into understanding that uh, those, most of those things that move around, not all of them, and the particular ways they move are diagnostic. Uh, I mean, this is the same problem a baby has to solve, right? I mean, there are plenty of things that move in your environment, including the, the pendulum or the clock. Mm -hmm. Is that an agent? Uh, well, no, it turns out its movement doesn't quite qualify. There's um, a host of patterns that, that kids pick up on. At least there's some evidence that many people with ASD don't pick up on those. Uh, and they, in short, have to learn them uh, the old-fashioned way, right? But but the argument, cutting back to religion quickly, because uh, that's really what we're interested in here, is is that um, if it's the case, as you, I think, correctly asserted a little earlier in this, this discussion, uh, that theory of mind and and sort of agents are at the at the core of, of sort of most religious systems, uh, and that if I'm right, that it's sort of our maturationally natural theory of mind that makes us able to readily understand that stuff straight away, uh, to have representations that we find unproblematic, and as you quite nicely put it just a little while ago, although a little different, close enough that we get it immediately. Uh, the argument in short is, is that if you don't have theory of mind, if you are mind blind, then there's at least some reason to think you may not get it immediately. Uh, and that this stuff could be rather puzzling in some regards. Um, and uh, when I made these suggestions, I, I, I don't know if I was the first person to ever suggest this, but I was one of the sort of early ones, I guess, actually in a paper that was, came out in the year 2000 um, that was a kind of predecessor to this book. That we've been discussing, uh, that is to say, the naturalness of religion um, and uh, why religion is natural and, and science is not. Um, but since I and a few other folks have sort of explored this possibility, uh, there's been a sort of huge literature that has arisen now, uh, experimental literature. And, you know, I'd love to tell you that it unequivocally cuts one way or cuts the other way. Um, it, it's it's a mixed bag, to be honest. But I want to make clear uh, some things that I'm not asserting. I'm not asserting that autistic people cannot be raised religiously. Of course they can. 
I'm not asserting that they can't memorize uh, all sorts of statements uh, about religion. Of course they can. Uh, I'm not asserting that they would uh, be uncomfortable even necessarily with uh, ritual. In fact, there's some reason to believe they might be a good deal more comfortable with ritual than, um, than neurotypical people. Uh, I'm not asserting that those rituals can't get them excited. I'm not asserting that they won't say things like, I believe in God. Uh, I, I mean, it would require rather subtle more, more subtle tests of having to see, uh, you know, sort of in short, I'm suggesting that there might be reason to think there might be some impairment about their ability to carry out inferences. You know, well, it would have to be, it would have to be, it would require some training perhaps, right, in ways that it would not require training for, uh, say, normal people. Exactly. Uh, and indeed, when I mentioned the fact that, uh, I mean, what I was alluding to is got a, in the developmental literature is called the false belief task. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, neurotypical kids, by the time they are through their fifth year of life, they're solving this problem. Okay. And that is understanding that someone else can have a false belief. Um, many, many high, well, virtually all high functioning people with ASD get this problem solved by the time they're, they're in their teenage years, um, sort of standardly where this uh, happens. Well, what's going on? Well, as you just put it about the, in this specific religious case, uh, I mean, they've just gotten a lot more experience about the world and they've had, you know, concerned folks who talk to them about uh, social uh, uh, niceties and uh, uh, in short, they've sort of had to build a kind of uh, what I call an ersatz theory of mind, a kind of replacement theory of mind. They haven't got one that comes naturally, so they've got one that comes reflectively. And presumably they'd be more attracted to sort of a, a, a deistic uh, approach to, to religion. It would make, make more intuitive sense than something that has all the kind of richness and pageantry of, of more traditional religion. That's a possibility. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I haven't thought about the precise form that, uh, you know, uh, uh, such an influenced theology might take, but sure, that's a possibility. So last thing uh, in, in towards the end of this book, uh, and of course this was written over 10 years ago, you, you talk about the fragile foundation on which science sits, right? And that science is, because of its counterintuitive nature, it's it's something that, that has to continually be kind of reinforced institutionally and uh, through education, through universities, and, and so forth. And for the last year and a half or so, uh, <laughs> there's been a, a running uh, discussion about the precariousness of, of science, institutionalized science as part of our culture. So <laughs> as, I was wondering if, 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 if the, the, what's happened in the last year and a half has um, just bolstered your concern about the fragility of scientific understanding. Uh, unequivocally. Uh, yeah, I, I, I include that as one of what I call uh, seven surprising uh, sort of uh, consequences of the position in the final chapter. Um, and I think when we live in modern America, where uh, scientific institutions have a kind of cultural prestige in, in many quarters, uh, and where there is such uh, large support and funding uh, and institutions uh, are extensive, especially in the biomedical sciences, but, but in science more generally. It might be sort of puzzling for somebody to suggest that science, its existence and its persistence are fragile. Um, but um, I think indeed we've, we've had an experience in the last year and a half or I would maybe even argue the last four or five years that uh, begins to get at some of the things I was concerned about. Um, 
it's not even a matter so much of, of uh, necessarily teaching a lot more science, though I think that would be a great thing, and that we should have a wider understanding of science in the uh, general population in any democracy. Um, but even if just sort of, among other things, just knowledge of history. Uh, I mean, uh, I actually, I write a blog for Psychology Today, and I wrote a piece about anti-vaxxing, anti-vaxxers, vaccine-hesitant people, mm -hmm. uh, before the pandemic occurred. Um, actually, about six months before the pandemic really sort of uh, came into fruition uh, in the middle of 2019. Um, You know, as I said, it doesn't require sort of uh, sophisticated uh, biomedical knowledge, uh, just the knowledge of the history of epidemics in humans, uh, in our species, is enough to, um, I think, convince people that um, the invention of vaccination is a fundamentally of fundamental importance, and it's absolutely crucial to uh, the, the persistence of our uh, modern way of life. Um, but it's just a single illustration uh, of uh, the kind of cultural and social forces that are being, that have arisen and that are being manipulated uh, because science is, it seems to me, finally uh, critical to an open society, to a society that uh, permits the criticism. I mean, it is the quintessence of sort of human critical capacities. That was a point I was making much earlier in the discussion. But those critical capacities lap over into politics and into religion and into economics and into, you know, every dimension of life. And, and the preservation of science is, it seems to me, a, 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 just a, a, a major cultural force on this front. And of course, what I'm arguing in the book uh, is that um, at least from the standpoint of sort of uh, looking at human psychology and looking at the, the structure of human minds, there's, there's not great reassurance about science's ability to, to sort of continue to, to progress and to continue to uh, exist. Um, it's radically counterintuitive. Uh, the, the forms of, of intellectual activity and cognitive processing that are required uh, involve uh, extensive education and tremendous discipline. Um, these institutions are very, very expensive. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, you can you, you can see any number of fronts on which, if all of these pillars aren't in place, uh, then science sort of begins to falter. Uh, and, and so, if scientists if scientists fail to understand how counterintuitive their practices really are, then they'll they'll fail to understand why they have difficulty communicating their insights. Oh sure. Um, Excuse me, just a second. I need to get a quick drink. Yeah, absolutely. Um, remember, I argued early on that for Kahneman System 1, I think there are two stories there. There's a maturational naturalist and there's a practice naturalist. And both of those are foundations for intuition for things that become ready and automatic and instantaneous and easy. They're cognitively easy things. But practice naturalness arises from extensive experience. In, if, in short, it's about getting expertise. Now, when I use the term expertise, I don't mean anything too fancy about that. I mean, you know, uh, and to use an example you gave, I mean, uh, riding a bicycle. There are a whole bunch of people who are experts at riding bicycles. You and I probably, I am, uh, you are, you know, or at least I used to be. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we can do Can't it. Can't forget. Not a problem. We had a lot of experience at it. Uh, we knew instantly how to solve various problems that might arise as we were riding along. Um 
But likewise, to, to pick another common example, literacy, our ability to simply write. I mean, note, uh, as I tell students, I'll tell them, I give them a sentence to write, and they write it in longhand. And I ask them, in the middle of that fourth word, when you were going from the transition from the second to the third letter, did you think about it? And the answer, of course, is no. This is just something that flies automatically. Well, why? Not because that's anything in our genes. <clears throat> Not because that's anything that's innate. That's because we spent 12 years going to school, learning how to read, learning how to write. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's no less true for the scientists. The scientists have been gone another 10 or 12 years, and they've learned an area of uh, empirical inquiry uh, cold, and they are, have become eminently familiar with it. But what that means is they've become experts. They've acquired practice naturalness. And so note, here's the punchline, right? It's now become intuitive for them in a way that sometimes it is difficult to remember, mm -hmm. that it is not intuitive for people who are not experts. Anyone who has been a teacher knows about this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden yeah. it's not, and because oftentimes, I mean, you know, I, I think George Bernard Shaw got this all wrong, right? I mean, he said those who can do and those who can't teach but many people who can do can realize that simply doing, I mean, that's that's a way to help teaching and to aid learning. But sometimes, and in fact, oftentimes, it's not enough. You've got to be able to teach. The teacher has to know how to say. And things that are intuitive are precisely the things that we find usually somewhat laborious to say. Well, Robert, it's been fascinating talking to you. Um, hopefully we can all go and start cultivating our scientific intuition. <laughs> That's not an oxymoron. Uh, I recommend everybody check this out, Why Religion is Natural and Science is Not, and also the latest book, Hearing Voices and Other Matters of the Mind. I hope to chat again soon, Robert, and when the next book comes out. Maybe that one is. There it is. Okay. All right. Hope to chat when the next book comes out. Thanks very much. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.